All right, so starting off with blockchain. Okay, so blockchain, uh, I think kind of the second bullet really explains it well of kind of what it is literally. It is a group of blocks that has a cryptographic hash of the previous block, a timestamp, and whatever transaction data is important to the, the blockchain itself. Okay, so it is literally a chain of blocks. Okay, and why do you care? Okay, does anybody here know what a ledger is in like that word, L E D G E R? Can you tell me? Yeah, so has anybody ever seen a checkbook, much less balanced one? All right, so, or like, uh, has anybody here used like Mint, um, you know, or any of the other kind of, you know, or banking application of any kind? Um, that set of transactions that you see, that's a ledger, okay? It's kind of a throwback term. Um, like, like, you don't, I don't hear it that much anymore, but it's really an accounting term, okay? So, the thing you write down all the transactions in is called a ledger. Uh, and, you know, in the old days, it used to be literally written down on, you know, in a, a book and it would have one line and that's, that's where the term ledger comes from. So a distributed ledger, what's interesting about a distributed ledger is typically a ledger needs to be owned by one person. Okay. So think about Google Sheets. Okay. Which you can have multiple people co like commit to it, right? You can have multiple people writing in the same spreadsheet. However, there's only one spreadsheet, right? So it's not really distributed, okay? In the sense that you can't take one transaction from over here and one transaction from over there and another transaction from over there. You have to have all the transactions all together and they all have to be like ordered in order to get the output that makes sense, right? Because you have a bunch of, you know, like you're doing sums of everything, you know, some of them are negative, some are positive, and you get to your bank balance at the end, right? So a distributed ledger, the whole idea of it is that it doesn't need to be all in the same place, okay? But there's a way to put them together in the correct order, okay? So, uh, I hate uh, jumping my own stories here, but um, so maybe I'll talk about it in a minute. But one of the things that uses a mechanism like this, it's not actually blockchain, but uses a mechanism like this is Git. Okay. It's a distributed source control system using some of the same techniques that you use in blockchain. Okay. That, that way, when I have a file over here and a file over there, we know the order that they have to go in. To apply their changes because those are transactions, much like monetary transactions, right? So it uses, and what I want to kind of we'll dig down into this a little bit. So blockchains typically use what's called a Merkle tree, named after a guy last name was Merkle, who uh, actually patented it, which I was kind of surprised that was possible uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, I want to say. Um, which relies on a cryptographic hash. And yeah, I'm going to do this the other way because uh, I think I the order of my slides is wrong. Um, so actually, let's start here. Um, all right. Does anybody know what hash means? All right. Uh, if you are not American, this is one beat hash, actually. If you're also not, you know, primarily grew up in the south of the US, this is corned beef hash. Okay, corned beef hash has got to be one of the best foods on the planet. Okay, it's terribly bad for you. And on top of that, the kind that comes to can arguably is better than the one homemade. Okay, like it is terrible for you. It's what? Yeah, so um, there are people who, you know, like a corned beef hash. And there are people who are wrong, but otherwise, you know, we like to be very clear. So there are other kinds of hash as well. Um, but as you can see from the picture, the term hash means basically a mishmash of stuff. Okay. Um, and in fact, aside from the can version having kind of taken over what corned beef hash means, 
it, it kind of doesn't really mean any particular set of ingredients except for the label of corned beef. So you expect that to be in there. But in general, like hash just kind of means all this stuff. And a hash, uh, like when you talk about food, a hash is generally, uh, you know, it's often consumed for breakfast. It's usually leftovers. Um, and it usually has some sort of protein like corned beef and then a few vegetables, but they're typically uh, leftovers. So for me, this is something they never really explained to me uh, when I was talking about it from a tech perspective. Because how many people here have used a hash table or a hash mat? Okay. So does anyone know what the hash means in the hash table or hash map? And the real thing is called a hash table. Uh, Java calls it a hash map for reasons. Um, but the real thing is called a hash table. So what is what is the hash? Right. So so the hash in a hash table, and this is why I was always like I never really like understood this in terms of the word hash is because a hash table, what it means is you have like the things glommed together, okay, in such a way that you can more easily find it again. Okay, right? So that you have, you know, it can be something really simple. It could be like your hash table could be all the things that start with the letter A go in this bucket, all the things that start with the letter B go in another bucket. So the the or the uh, like O of N basically of trying to find a thing goes, you know, gets short, right? It gets smaller. Uh, so, but the word hash really means just, you know, an amalgam of stuff, okay? And so when you're doing a hash table, that amalgam is basically a thing to find stuff better. But you have lots of other kinds of hashes. For example, we use hashes to like identify the value or the kind of the, Trying to think of the right word that isn't cryptographic, um, but try to identify the like veracity of a thing. Okay. And so we use various kinds of hashes to, in this case, when we talk about a cryptographic hash function, we're trying to do a, a, like an algorithm, we're trying to make a method, okay, that will give us, if I have this text. It will give me a value like something like that, right? That will change a lot if there's a minor change here. Okay, so, and I know there's an example in here. Oh, yeah, so, you know, between these two, right, there's a, only a one letter difference, but the hashes are very different. Okay. And the reason you want to use something like a cryptographic hash with it is because um, that's what you're trying to prove. You're trying to prove that if I have this hash value, it will always represent this thing and not that thing. <coughs> Sorry. Why is this useful? Well, if we think of this thing as being a one gigabyte document, right? What do you think might be smaller to send over the internet to find out what the thing was? Okay, so what we could do is we could say, I have this hash. Is it the same as the one that this file purports to have? So what I want to say is like, I have a you know one gig file that has the red box over and over and over again. I have a file that also has the same hash. I can then prove that comparing the hashes to each other, that they're the same without having to actually transfer a file back. Does that make sense? Okay. So the thing that's interesting about like a cryptographic hash function in particular is that the function that you're using is optimized for speed of creation of the hash rather than uh you know kind of other uh options right so uh like and i, I don't really say it great there like it's still a good encryption method it's just that like when you're encrypting something you're encrypting stuff all the time you want something that encrypts quickly okay but maybe doesn't vary as much between outputs 
right? Because you know, you all know, right? Every algorithm that you do has trade-offs at what they do better than others. Okay, so when you see like SHA one, okay, and you see these all the time, SHA one, SHA two, uh, I don't know, other good names, more I'm sure. Those are generally speaking cryptographic hashes. They may not be great at actually doing encryption because actually doing encryption requires encrypting all the time. Whereas this, the primary use case is actually comparing the outputs. So the actual encryption activity can be slow. Does that make sense? Okay, so every algorithm has different trade offs on what they prioritize. In the case of cryptographic hash functions, you want to prioritize. Um, like kind of that top hole, like minor changes equal large changes, the smaller this can be and still be useful, the better, all those kinds of things, rather than like speed of encryption. All right, so why do we care about those? Because in that technique called a Merkle tree, these use hash functions in order to prove the thing down here. So the only thing, so first of all, this does not look like a hash table, right? It looks like a tree. In fact, it looks like a binary tree. And in fact, it has very little to do with anything at all like a hash table. And this is where, at least for me, for a long time, was my confusion point because nobody ever told me that there was a difference between like a hash and a hash table. Like I thought they always went candidate. So, uh, so the only thing that's in here that's actual data are the L's at the bottom. All right. And imagine these being big pieces of data. Okay, like I said, a gigabyte file or whatever. So what you want to do is you want to toss around on the internet or whatever in your distributed ledger, for example, these methods, these hash functions or hash values, sorry, um, so that you can do comparisons and you can have an idea that. This thing that purports to be L1 is L1. Okay, so when I have a copy of a document, and that document, if we're talking about, say, a cryptocurrency, that document is some sort of ledger transaction, right? And a dollar to a well, dollar transaction or currency transaction. So I have something over here that says L1 purports to have taken place at this time, it purports to have been for this amount from this person to this other person, okay? <coughs> Sorry. So what I can do is I can go ask my friends, other computers, um, you I know you have an L1, tell me what the function, what the value you get for the hash function is, and then I can say, oh, that's the same, without actually having to compare the, the files, okay? Does that make sense? And the way these Merkle trees work is you start at the top, okay, and then based on what you're looking for, it can give you uh, basically the, the right part of the tree to get to the actual hash function that you, or hash value that you need. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, it's just like a regular old binary tree. It's very efficient for searching or kind of getting to the part you want um, because of the way it's laid out. And there, at least as far as I can tell, it seems like it is very unusual to have a Merkle tree that is anything more than, than binary, like the two coming off. Okay, You obviously, if you think about it, right, you could have a bunch more of these hanging off here, right? But most of the time it's just two because the speed of walking this is more important than its uh, compact. Okay. Everybody following? All right. So first we have quarterly hash, then we have hashes, then we have cryptographic hashes, which is basically just you know securely doing a hash. Um, and then we get a Merkle tree, which makes use of the cryptographic hashes. Then finally, we get back to our blockchain, which Specifically, a blockchain, right, is one of those blocks is that's L1 or L2 or L3, right, is one of these blocks. But when we talk about a blockchain, it has these kind of data elements, a timestamp, transaction data. And then, um, and then it's encrypted, or sorry, it's hashed 
in terms of the previous thing in the in the transaction, right, or the prior transaction, so that you can walk the order of the transactions correct, even in a distributed way. Right? So blockchain has been around for a while, but um, and I would argue this is still true today, was always a solution kind of looking for a problem. Okay. And one of the ones that made it very popular, which you may have heard of, oh, actually, see, I did my slides all out of order, uh, is cryptocurrency, okay? In particular, Bitcoin, right? So, all right, does anybody know the legend of Bitcoin? All right, so do you want to tell it or do you want me to? Right, so, so there is this person or persons, no one really knows, there's a name, but no one's quite sure if it's actually a person or a group. What I think is kind of funny is that uh, this is, I believe, still true of Ruby, the language, um, that no one's actually quite sure where either one of them comes from, okay? Just that there is somebody who, like, there's a name out there, but nobody knows who that name is actually attached to. Uh, so, and, I want to say somebody might have broken who it was for Ruby, but I can't remember now. But for a long time, it was in the same boat. So Bitcoin, I don't know, X years ago, I can't remember exactly how long, um, took this blockchain concept and said, hey, I have a distributed ledger. That means I can make currency. Okay. So what, you know, does anybody here know what it takes to make a currency? literally nothing okay because the way currency works is it's all about faith okay this is why people talking about the gold standard in the us it's such a weird thing to say because it's really kind of worthless the fact that the money you use or the currency you use actually has a real world value in and of itself let's say instead of using you know paper dollar bills right they were each little points of gold that actually has very little to do with the value of the currency when you use it to trade for other things, right? Because at the end of the day, essentially you're you're doing barter, okay? So like, you know, I'm going to trade my cow for your sheep. It's just that I'm going to trade this piece of paper for your sheep, okay? And the number of sheep I get is how much that paper bill will get you when you trade cow. Right, so you know, go take an economic course if you want to know how this really works. But essentially, currency is just a matter of faith. So there's one thing that really raises the level of faith is where you have some you know organization that has like guns and you know land, aka a government, saying I believe in this particular currency. That's kind of why the U.S. dollar is the value that it is. But I would actually argue, and definitely not an economist, okay, but I would actually argue that the U.S. dollar has actually gone beyond the fact that the U.S. government guarantees it in any way, okay, because as far as I'm concerned, we've had a few presidents now who I haven't had a lot of faith in, and if that faith was directly correlated to the value of the dollar, you know, you would expect a nose dive of the currency value. But the US dollar has now become so pervasive worldwide. There's so many people who have those literal paper bills that it almost has gone beyond the fact that it has to be backed by the US government. And so I would argue, and so kind of at the end of the day, a currency is just faith. Okay, so what happens with Bitcoin? All right, well, Bitcoin uses a mathematical algorithm to create new blocks in the blockchain. And because of, essentially because of this and the Merkle tree, essentially, as you create more and more blocks, it becomes more and more expensive to create a new block. And when I say expensive, I mean number of computers involved in doing the thing, which may or may not actually translate to dollars, but it does translate to it's more difficult. 
So early on in Bitcoin's uh, creation, it was relatively easy to create a new block in the blockchain. Now it's extremely hard. Okay. okay, basically the only way you can do it now is if you, you know, pawn a whole bunch of servers and turn it into a TOS farm and, you know, just start, you know, crashing them out. Yeah. Credit, because at this point, so the calculation that matters, right, is how much does it cost you in whatever currency? to create new blocks versus the value you get out of those blocks, right? So if it, let's make it say I was making dollar bills, right? Um, so I go down to the copying, you know, the copying store and I bring a dollar bill and I make some copies, okay? Well, the value I get out of those is actually pretty low because when I try to use them on the street, almost nobody will take them because they can tell they're not real dollars, right? So. The cost for me to copy them costs me something, paper, you know, ink, whatever. So, but then the value is relatively low. So let's up the ante. Okay. Now I go and buy my own printing press and I go and get metal plates and I start using copy as part of the is the material that I create the uh, dollars with. But my costs have risen dramatically, right? But my ability to pass that money as real money has also gone up. So potentially they're they're closer. In some ways, the way the US dollar keeps from getting counterfeited is because it's so expensive to create it and kind of secondarily but similar, the penalty for faking it is so high that if you kind of combine those two numbers together, the expense of creating it is way higher than the value you'll get uh, for the actual dollars. Does that make sense? So whenever you're dealing with a cryptocurrency, well, not whenever, but most of the time when you're dealing with a cryptocurrency, the calculation to create new blocks normally um, is a certain amount of expense. What you want to know is, does that expense reach um, the value you'll get for Bitcoin? So <clears throat> what Google can't afford to do is take such a risk so while they might be able to calculate blocks and the expense might work out right, the variability in the Bitcoin market means they don't know. Because if Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin I think is down to 54 or 53 today, uh, 53,000. So let's say it costs them, you know, 57,000 to make one block. Well, then they're in trouble, right? Because now it's down to 53. But last week it was up at 65. So then it made sense. But what companies aren't very good at, they, they don't like risk, right? So risk, kind of like the jail time penalty, comes into that expense value or that expense calculation as part of the expense. So that's largely why. So for most, at least most of the time, uh, and this is where governments doing questionable activities starts to come into the mix a bit. But for most people, for most of the time, the only way creating new blocks of Bitcoin is that ratio works out is if you're stealing your block creation resources. Okay? And by stealing, I mean hacking, pawning, and you know, subverting machines into doing it so that you're not actually paying a direct cost for it. Now, what's interesting is that there's been significant concerns about, okay, there are organizations, let's, let's just you know, ignore whether they're doing things illegally or not. There are organizations that are creating blocks. How, so the problem is, is that those blocks are starting to become so expensive in resources, and I don't mean dollar resources, I mean energy resources, that they're starting to have a, a material and measurable impact on climate change. So now there's a social aspect to the expense of creating these blocks. And most of the organizations that are creating the blocks really don't care how they're being seen, but the governments who represent, theoretically, the people who are worried about climate change are starting to care, at least on this one aspect, there's other reasons too, but are starting to care because there's enough people making noise and protesting about these climate change impacts because the energy usage 
that they're being more aggressive about going after these, you know, let's just assume for the sake of argument, actors. They may or may not be bad actors. But so that's particularly interesting is that those energy use concerns may actually result in some of it. Um, the other thing that is interesting, and this is actually why I've been following Bitcoin for a long, long time, is that because it is, you know, completely open, uh, it means that anything that you can think of that is related to regulation on stocks and markets, et cetera, is fair game. Anything. Everything is legal because there, there's no regulation at all. All right. So who's here has heard of a like, Ponzi scheme? All right, so I heard this secondhand, so I'm not entirely sure if it's true, but there's a currency out there called Tether that is trying to be what's called a stable coin. Okay, or you know, like a class. And what they do is they actually try to invest in Bitcoin and other coins such that they can give you a stable value of that currency. Okay, I don't think they have a blockchain at all, but I don't know that much about it, but I don't think they have a blockchain at all. All they do is buy other you know, fake currencies, right? To try to give you an even amount on it. The thing is, is that one of the things that I heard this week, and like I said, I don't know if it's true, is that in fact, Tether was actually a Ponzi scheme because even though normally in the US, Ponzi schemes are illegal, they're regulated by all of the other financial constructs that we have. So Ponzi schemes, when you talk about cryptocurrency, whatever, um, has anybody ever heard of a pump and dump? Okay, that's basically where you pump up stock, like the stories about a stock or whatever. And you uh, basically, pump the, so you go buy a bunch of stock, sorry. Then you pump up the stock by telling a bunch of people to buy it in various different ways. Uh, it used to be very common to actually cold call a million grandmothers and get them all to buy the stock. Then you dump your stock once the price has gone up, thereby often crashing the stock itself and all the grandmas lost all their money. Uh, so. Regulated against insider trading, regulated against all these things that you aren't allowed to do is purely because we have a bunch of laws that are about our existing markets. These cryptocurrencies don't have any of those. They're unregulated. And this is why I get really annoyed when people say all regulation is bad. Well, it isn't really. It's just you haven't encountered anything that was actually unregulated. So, uh, so talking about cryptocurrency. Um, two things I want to point out. So, why are cryptocurrencies better than than you know government backed currencies, or why do people consider them better? <clears throat> Actually, there's one reason why that is, which is there's no central authority. So, the U.S. government at the end of the day regulates every aspect of the U.S. stock. Okay, so they decided tomorrow that the actually they've tried this a couple times. The U.S. penny doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist anymore, right? There is a central authority that says, this is the way this currency works. With most, like all the ones I'm aware of, it doesn't necessarily have to be true, but all the ones that I'm aware of, cryptocurrencies don't have that central authority. So therefore, the value of the currency is purely in the market, which when you talk about the regulation side of it, can be a bad thing, but it can be a good thing if you don't trust any of the central authority. Okay, a lot of people don't trust the U.S. government. A lot of the time, with good reason. If you have all your money invested in Bitcoin, you're just trusting the market, which has its own trade-offs, right? But at least you're aware of them, and you have theoretical control. The sorry, the big thing that Bitcoin did, and I should have said this slightly differently, was solve the double double spending problem of digital assets, essentially. You know, if I have a dollar bill in my pocket and I give it to you to buy something, I can't go give it somewhere else, right? Because I physically don't have it anymore. When you're using blockchain to, to basically back the currency, it solves that problem because I have literally given it to you. There's literally, through these cryptographic mechanisms, there's no way for me to remove that transaction or repeat the transaction. Okay, and so double spending was basically the big key for lots and lots of digital goods being, you know, kind of used in any sort of currency model, currency barter, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Not exactly. So the way the cryptographic functions work is that you can actually just attach a transaction onto these blocks. And so, uh, so a block is usually made up of a whole bunch of transactions. It varies by currency, how much they are. One state Bitcoin, I want to say it's, it's like 3,000 or 300. Is it more than, I don't know, whatever. So the point is, anybody can push a transaction onto a block. So you don't need to generate the block. You don't need somebody to validate your transaction. You just do the math yourself. And the math yourself is not the kind of scale of creating a block. Okay, it's just, you know, whatever. You can literally do it in seconds on most computers. So that's what's happened, right? Is there's a, started to be a number of banks who do this activity for you. But at the end of the day, that's all there is to it. Um, oh, almost out of time. I know this is going to go faster. All right, so I wanted to cover a couple of these. Um, Bitcoin, you're probably all aware of. It's definitely the granddaddy of them all. Ethereum, um, oh no, sorry, Litecoin also came out really soon after Bitcoin never got the popularity for whatever reason. Um, Ethereum takes some kind of different paths. Uh, one thing that, for example, that Ethereum can do is do transactions for things that are not the currency. Okay, so this is where NFTs come in, for example. Uh, Dogecoin was actually a joke based on an internet meme. Um, and now there's also a bunch of other joke currencies like the, the, the I think there's, is there a nine cat uh, coin or is it just NFT? I think it's it might be just NFT. But uh, and then this one is also kind of interesting, Stellar, which uh, is specifically a cryptocurrency model to allow for large transactions between banks. So the idea with Stellar is that you wouldn't go out and buy this. But if you had a bank and you want to make a large transaction with another bank, and there's lots of regulation around this problem. <coughs> so, for example, a US bank is not allowed to, to, to do anything with funds with a bank in Iran, for example. Let's say you want to get around that, you know, stranglehold because for whatever reason, that's where something like Stellar can come in handy. All right. Um, I think their I think their ideals are a little bit higher than that their real goals are. Uh, to be able to remove central authority from bank relationships, right? So that they don't, because the other, let's take a less obvious example, right? The banking law in Switzerland, the Cayman Islands, and the US are all quite different. And so as a banker, it's expensive to move money around with them. Because they're all different, you have to follow different regulations under different situations. Something like seller comes in and there's no regulation, so you kind of just move the money there without having to deal with those regulations, sort of. All right, uh, let's quickly talk about NFTs. Um, okay, so we have all these blockchains now with the cryptocurrencies and people started to say, huh, okay, so a blockchain, what it does is it lets you say, I have a unique thing here, even if that thing is digital, right? Because the problem with, like, uh, let's talk about art because that's the most common NFT, right? Um, is if I have a digital piece of art that I created, there is literally no way to prove that I made it, right? So this is actually, if you think about, uh, I don't know if anyone knows about this, but like maps, okay, have this problem, right? Maps are very easy to copy and always have been. So cartographers used to sign their maps by putting intentional mistakes in them. So if you look at old maps, there will actually be errors in there that a, the cartographer who created it can point it out and know it's there, but you won't know it when you copy it, right? Some digital artists have done similar to try to solve this problem, but now we have a way using this blockchain to say, this is literally the first one of these because I give it that cryptographic hash, right? And so I know that this one was the original. So people will sell, let's, for lack of a better term, they kind of sell that like transaction in the blockchain. They're not really selling the art, they're selling the transaction that says, you bought this, you own it, it is yours. Okay, so another example I saw was uh, uh, Stanford or Berkeley, I can't remember which one. Uh, 
uh, sold the patent, uh, uh, like the patent filing documents for two of their big discoveries using NFTs. Uh, they use Ethereum in particular um, by saying, like, they don't get the patent. Like, I didn't get, I don't buy the patent, but I do get that that history moment of when the patent was filed. That's what I'm buying. Okay. So I always compare NFTs to being kind of like baseball cards, right? Or any sports related kind of card like that is that, you know, they go up in value by rareness, right? So you take a rookie card for a baseball player and the rookie card is worth way more usually than all the rest of their baseball cards because they were only a rookie for one year, right? So therefore the number of cards is small in theory. Um, someone who was a, a player many years ago is gonna have fewer cards in circulation, so the value goes up. Same idea, okay? So again, it's really a faith thing, same as the currency thing, is that it's market driven. If everybody in here thinks this rookie card of Babe Ruth is valuable, then it is. Okay? Exactly the same way NFTs work. But uh, for things like art, then it starts to get somewhat more interesting is in places like games where you can have, like, uh, let's say it's a fighting game and you have weapons. Some of those weapons are uniques, okay? Even if there's a way to manufacture that weapon, you can prove that you have the unique because you have the NFT, okay? You have the transaction. So you have the unique, and maybe the unique is a special bonus or whatever. But that's where, so it has a real value, you know, in the sense of, you know, you're in the game and it, it does something special. But, it's based on the same method. Okay. Um, tickets to events are a thing that they've been toying with. I don't know if anyone's been doing this, um, but this is where you use tickets as an NFT. So you have the digital version of the ticket. And I tried very hard to get a, a clip from, does anybody here watch the show Bob's Burgers? All right, more of you should watch it. It's hilarious. Uh, but there's a whole thing in there about one character has tickets to a, a, you know, a concert and um, wants to pretend to give the tickets away so they make a copy of the tickets. And then at the end of the story, they end up with, they actually have a copy of the tickets too, not the real tickets. So that's kind of what, you know, another mechanism using this NFT, you can prove whether you have the real ticket. And so because you can prove that you have the real ticket, you can then, uh, you know, resell the ticket. Okay. Uh, sometimes referred to as scalping, but um, it, when it's legitimate, it's not even called scalping. But that's kind of the idea with tickets. Uh, yeah, and so at the end of the day, an NFT is a certificate of authenticity backed up by this cryptographic hash somewhere in the block. Yeah. Where is like Ethereum's role in that? Why? Oh, so the reason I mentioned it here is because Ethereum is one of the few. I don't, I don't know of any others, but probably are, but it's one of the few that can actually store NFTs versus like monetary transactions. Um, so as a result, it, it, like Ethereum is the most common way uh, to use it. And so this is not Ethereum, the currency, this is Ethereum, the blockchain. Um, yeah. So you can dissolve the transactions. Right. Correct. You do not get the copyright. Yeah. So, why are you saying Exactly. So, it's like I said before, it's like uh, if I own the rookie card for uh, Babe Ruth, I have no rights on his likeness, on his playing, on, you know, kind of anything of real value. All I own is this perceived value of the rookie card. Sure, I own the paper. Yes, um, I don't think anybody collects baseball cards because they like having the physical paper. Okay. All right. I mean, physical things you have that nobody else has. Like the you have. Yeah, yeah. So, so the analogy is not perfect. Definitely. That's why I don't understand. I guess I don't understand. Like, because they said that's valuable. Like the idea of that is valuable. Yeah. Like you can Right. 
it started to collect it. So, I mean, that's the question, right? We don't know. Well, I, I'll, I mean, I, I, that's why I think the baseball card analogy is a pretty strong one, is that at some point, it is very possible, right, that that big root card becomes just a piece of paper. Based on bean days, for example, right? You owned it, it was a rare, you know, or a unique or a whatever. That doesn't mean that its value actually continues forever, right? Cabbage Patch Games or another good one. Um, yeah, maybe I should, I should be the better example um, because they they definitely should that. Um, you know, yeah. I just the baseball cards one usually works for people. So, but you're exactly right. Unless the only value to it is your your intrinsic value that you own a part of history potentially, or you know whatever you want to call it. You own a part of the art world. You own a part of whatever. So there is some intrinsic value to that. That's what, like, what's why I bring up the patent filing example is that people want to own a part of history in that way. So there's that, but it's the amount that you spent for it being justified or the amount that you can resell it for is purely based on the community who is interested. And so it will fluctuate just as much as they point to. Do you have a question? Yeah. All right, we are nearly over time. We probably have any other questions. I think I hit everything I wanted to talk about. Uh, that actually took me way longer than I expected. Yeah. So what about who saw and it goes off like cheap or like sold? How does that happen? How people like sell and as like sold some people are specializing like how they Oh yeah. So so yeah, you sell tweets, um, but not as a form of art. Well, in a sense, it is, or it's it's like a history, or like it doesn't. It, at the end of the day, for the most part, it doesn't really matter because what you're doing is you're selling the transaction, right? So you're saying in your transaction space in Ethereum blockchain or whatever, you're saying this tweet is owned by IP. That's it, right? So there's nothing that happens to the tweet itself. Yeah. No, but how do you, like, I know that, like, you have to let NFTs can be on anyone, but when it is on Twitter, how do you sell something on Twitter, under Twitter, as an NFT? Oh, uh, so that I would argue is because, um, well, it gets a little bit complicated because the copyright you have on the content you put on Twitter is a bit messy. Right. Um, but the long story short is because you aren't actually selling the thing that's on Twitter. You are you are literally just saying I'm a super important person. I am telling you that I sold you this tweet. But then does Twitter have the right to tell you how you can sell that? No. No, because at no point was Twitter involved in that transaction. Right? I could go and tell you, wait, I mean, this is not a great example, but I can go and tell you, like, the sold you the eye the tower. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you get to roll up and take the eye the tower, right? No, I was just confused because, like, if, if it's on Twitter, like, it's not like taking a screenshot and selling it. They're actually selling the post. Well, when you take a screenshot and sell it, you're not selling the screenshot either. Yeah, you're selling the screenshot. Right. I don't know how that would work with other companies. Mm -hmm. To be clear, very possible that five years from now, some smart lawyer is going to come up with the exact scenario you're talking about, and I'm going to be completely wrong because it's untested in law, right? We don't, we have no real idea. I would argue that it's unlikely to win because you're not actually selling anything in Twitter. Yeah. You know, maybe Twitter will change their terms of service next week and says anything posted here, we own the NFT. I don't know how to pull it off, but yeah. it's plausible. Yeah, sorry, uh, feel free to take off whatever uh, or ask questions. Uh, I have. Um, yeah, you know, so it, is, it basically is a very risky investment. So I also own a bunch of very risky tech stocks, right? 
So it's basically about risk tolerance and portfolio distribution. So, you know, like most, if, if you're using most of what you're above board, like Bitcoin or whatever, um, and you're doing it through some place like Coinbase, uh, you know, or whatever the other bank, the likelihood of it essentially getting stolen or lost is very large. But it's so volatile. But it's ridiculous. So on one side, I bought, you know, I bought a bunch of Bitcoin at uh, at 12k, and even though it's it's fluctuated 15k in the past, you know, few weeks, I'm still up, right? So I didn't I didn't spend enough. So there was those like like when people buy the Bitcoin, like perceived value of the Bitcoin. Essentially, yeah. I mean, did you did you follow anything about um? Uh, GameStop? Yeah, like, like same exact thing. It's like GameStop is a garbage company that treated their employees terribly for a long time. You know, but they were one of the last places to buy video game. Um, so they have some value to some people. Uh, so purely I and those going on very much the same way. And through confluence of events, they have to get really, you know, valuable for us. The other thing about those points is that the uh, price entry block is still quite low compared to the value of the first. Right. Yeah. So, so, like, you go and set up a first call, the expense ratio is still pretty good. Yeah. 
And so that's kind of what I'm getting at. It's like, yes, you have a number of limitations, but what I didn't see was anything that um, separated the line. What was the limitation? Like, basically, I want the user experience to not feel like those limitations are there, either because I'm not presented with the option to do something that I can't do, or by giving me some information that says, oh, this feature isn't available. Does that make sense? But yeah, I think it's like you can change it. Like you can change it. Again, don't forget, but largely, I mean, I was not looking at the requirements. So, you know, I click on everything. And if it didn't do what I expected it to do, I said, I'm going to do what you told me it does. Because it says right there, it has a problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, that is the thing that you So, so 
and I was happy to be very this war. If you stole the time, I'm still like, I'm either five, you know, three birds, I can only see the birds, or that is why I'm like that, or you make a lot of records, or something. Because exactly, like, why is it someone?
doesn't have any right or right? Um, so yeah, I think it would put the first thing there. Uh, and then I don't know if they're like this for the phone. So wouldn't you like to have a file? I didn't find it. There should be a file called white in the end. all have right in the root. Yeah. Uh, I did not find one if there's a mistake or the right thing I was looking at what I uh, and then so for comments, so I have like three like, 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 functions. Do we do that? So generally speaking, if it's a function that, that does something material, it's a good idea to, to have like a separate comment that says this is kind of what this does, and and generally what's more important is the input function. Yeah. Okay. So I do uh, yes, I do respect that. Um, and then so I think that's yeah, so basically, if I don't remember your project, but this is go run a linter on it or go run a formatter on it because, like, your your spacing is insufficient or whatever, which in my uh, uh, development environment is all high -level. like, I see it all, right? Um, and so I want it to be consistent and good because I know it sounds weird, particularly when you talk about a lot of experience programming. But the way it's laid out makes a big difference to how fast I can understand what this is going. Because I, I just, the constructs, I know what they look like. And when they look a particular way, it's easier for my brain to comprehend. Yeah. So, like I said, it's kind of like grammar and spelling. Yeah. It seems like kind of a, you know, nice to have, but it really isn't. Um, if you don't have good grammar and good spelling, it's much more difficult to understand it. Whatever your previous, the same is true with the layout of uh, especially if you're really used to writing. Yeah. No, it is not. Um, it would be really nice, uh, but I don't, I did not, I don't even know if I did that credit. Um, so, it is not expected. Um, you know, it's just easier to do that. Um, it's the kind of thing where, where you know, if I was going to take a point off the reforming to do the formatting and linting, and I saw it on my deployment, I'm like, whatever. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And if uh, you know, if you want me to, if there are parts of this that are real. Uh, yeah. Do the. I don't. I really don't know where much about this. Like I know, I think there's a way that you can say, please check this again. Yeah, so I'll add it. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Oh, I yeah, I So for the it's not especially data collected because you're saying that uh, it's an HTTPS and the bottom is HTTP. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh, it's yeah. not secure. Yeah. But when I change it to HTTP, 